Hello, my name is Vinny and I'm on a mission to get to 100 countries. But we're parking that for a minute because it's time for a flashback podcast. This is Africa Revisited, part two of two. So this is a flashback to January 2012. The podcast you're about to hear, I'm spending two months on a truck rumbling through eastern and southern Africa. I'm with 13 people I don't know. Uh, Well, at least I didn't know them a few weeks ago. But after many home-cooked stews around a fire, they've become friends. We've all been woken up by hyenas. We've all had depressing toilet stories, but we're all having immense fun. And if you'd like to see the vehicle that we did it on, or if you want to see pictures of similar trips, or if you want to book your own, go to oasisoverland.co.uk. That's the company we booked it with. They're not paying me for this. I just think they're really good. The podcast you're about to hear used to be loads of multiple podcasts, but I've taken out a tiny bit. I've mashed them together. I've cleaned the audio, and now it's two parts. Part one, you should have already heard. That was Kenya, Tanzania, and Malawi. This is part two you're about to hear, and that is going to be Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. This was recorded in 2012, and back then, Robert Mugabe was president of Zimbabwe. At that point, he'd done 32 years of power, and that was then. He carried on for a while. He ended up dying in 2019. I don't think anyone in Zimbabwe was upset about Robert Mugabe's death. Uh, Meanwhile, in South Africa, Jacob Zuma was corruptly running South Africa. Other than that, It all sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday. This podcast starts in the countryside of Malawi as I chat to one of my new truck travelling buddies, Laura. Hello, Laura. Uh, You're with Jodie. Uh, You're sharing a tent with Jodie, who who you may remember from podcast one. It's pitch black and there's a few bugs around and the rest of the team are in the distance having a fire. It's a lovely starry night and it's a beautiful setting here um malawi with bush camping but why are you so petrified well i'm loving the fire loving the stars but there was a massive tarantula uh, just over there behind the bushes not loving that every sort of four to five minutes you hear this <laughs> from one of the girls as something crawls over their leg <laughs> anyway malawi um i wanted to talk about the village walk that we did as we stayed in a beautiful beach uh, on Lake Malawi, which is looks like a sea. It's enormous. It's as big as one of the Great Lakes. Yeah, we stayed on this amazing beach resort and we had a good couple of nights out. But one of the, I think one of the most interesting things we did was take a walk around a local village with a guided tour. And it was really good. Well, we set off with Mel Gibson, was his name. Mel Gibson was his name. And it actually was his name. It was actually on his passport, apparently. His, his um, Malawi mother had watched some American films. So I called him Mel Gibson. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He told me. We were pretty close, me and Mel Gibson. I don't think he hates Jews, though, unlike the other one. <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia there for you. Um, yeah, so what did we do with Mel Gibson? Um, so he took, up, uh, took us off into his uh, house. First place we went was his house. So there was nothing in it. Um, his sister was sat outside, cutting up a, a dead chicken, making chicken soup, which was nice. Jodie loved that, being vegetarian. Um... And then we met all of his cousins, was it? Cousins and all their children. It's difficult to say. I mean, some of them were related to him, and a lot of people in the village were related to each other. But it was a village of about 3,500. But the beauty, I, th- I thought, is it didn't really matter. Like, no one actually knocked on his door when we were in the house. There was just, like, a trail of children coming in and out, laughing with us, and we were giving them balloons and pencils and having fun with them. It was difficult to say who owned who. You accosted one. Do you remember? <laughs> you, you you took one. You said you were going to put it in the truck and keep it forever. <laughs> Do you remember that one you had on you for about two hours? Really cute one that I just carried on my back for about two hours. Yeah, and we were like leaving the village and she still had a child hanging. It must have been about two. He must have been about two. And I said, um, I said to Mel Gibson, I said, Mel, shouldn't Laura leave one of the children here? <laughs> the one that she's like stolen? And you just looked at me as if I was a bastard. I was sizing up the size of the child and my bag and thinking, could I put him in? Morally right. (laughs) Definitely right. We 
had a really good time at Mel Gibson's house. I'll just try and describe it. As you said, there was nothing in it. it, it even and most places here don't have windows. There's just like holes in the walls. It was a mud hut with a thatched roof. You saw his kitchen, which literally just had a pestle and water in it. Nothing so like there. grinding up cereals and stuff. He gave, I love the fact that, by the way, that was the only thing in the kitchen, and he gave us a demo on how to use it. <laughs> I'll be honest, I am a bit backward, but I think I know how to use that one. <laughs> it was really hospitable. He did, though, have a little bit of a boudoir. Did you see in his bedroom? I did. I saw the leopard print bed sheets. Anyway. Not real leopard. No. Although it could easily have been. There are a few around here. And, um, yeah, he had a little side table, didn't he? It was quite luxurious in there, really, by Malawian standards. Aussie net over the top. To set it all off. Just a basic grass rug where everyone sits down. Then, to follow the theme of not having a lot, we went to the school, which has no chairs, no tables, um, and not a great deal of facilities, really. Now, how big were those class sizes? So there was actually 150 children to one teacher. They all just sat on the floor, no tables, no chairs, all with just an exercise book and a pencil. 150 kids to one teacher. There's four teachers in the whole school. They're the only people that are paid. Um, and everything else is do it yourself. Like all the kids arrive at six o'clock in the morning. Um, they were given machetes and scythes, <laughs> which uh, definitely would happen in the United States of America, and uh, told to go out and clear the jungle around the school. And when we arrived, it was break time. And there was just like, you know, six year olds hanging out with scythes, machetes. It's mental. The library was interesting. That's where we were. Um, a lot, all the books have been donated by various government agencies, including Canada. Yeah, it was well stocked, but I suppose it has to be when you've got that many students. I noticed that Mel Gibson um, sat back as the principal teacher talked to us about how the schools run and what goes on and how the kids are very proud to be there. And whilst the um, teacher, the principal, was talking to us, I noticed that Mel Gibson, even though we we're in the library of a school, lit up a cigarette. <laughs> totally forgot he'd done that. <laughs> and I said, Mel, can you do that? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. And the principal just laughed as if to say, why would you not be able to smoke in a school library? We had lots of children that followed us up the path to the school as well. And they weren't actually at school. They were all too little, little infants. And they all just sat outside the library waiting for us as well, didn't they? Yeah, they were with us for hours. That's when you picked up that one that I think is still in the truck. <laughs> Give it away. As well as the school, we went to the hospital. Now, this is really interesting for you and Jodie because you're both nurses in England. What were your thoughts on the hospital? The hospital was very limited. Nothing was sterile. He took us into the delivery suite where all the women have their babies and there was literally just three beds. Um, he said three women could give birth at the same time with just a curtain drape between them. Not very nice, to be honest. How do you know nothing was sterile? I didn't notice that, actually, on the day. How do you know? Because I asked him what sort of stuff they do to um, keep all their equipment sterile. And he kind of just said, we don't do anything. And asked me what we did back at home. And he was really fascinated. And, really? and asked if he could actually come to either mine or Jodie's hospital and work for us. What, on a like voluntary basis? I think he meant to be paid. Right. Both the school and the hospital quite understandably asked us for donations. And they were very kind to us. We gave them some money and said we might support them in future. Um, but it seems to me as if they're incredibly reliant on donations. I, he talked, for example, about the ambulance. You asked the question, what happens if I or Mel Gibson suddenly had a heart attack now? What would happen? And the answer was something like this. Well, if there was an ambulance around, then the clinic slash hospital we were in certainly couldn't do anything, so we'd put you in an ambulance and drive you for something like, I don't know, 100k to the nearest hospital, and they'd probably be able to... I think he said probably be able to fix you up. Cheers. Um, but there might not be an ambulance around because there was 15 communities. We were only in one of them, 15 villages, with one ambulance between them. Yeah, definitely. I also asked him if he had a heart attack in his house, how we'd get up to the hospital. And he said his brother would put him on his bike and pedal him up there, which I'm pretty sure by the time he got to the hospital, he'd be dead. Very difficult to get an unconscious person on a bicycle. I mean, it's hard enough to get a conscious person on the back of a bicycle. But surely an unconscious... What do you do with him? Stick him over the handlebars? 
I think just drape him over and pedal as fast as you can. Would it look like a giant human mascot on front of the bicycle? <laughs> as we're walking along, everyone is so happy to see us, and it's slightly weird for them to see Western faces. So everyone's hello, how are you? And some guys are like, do you want to buy some bananas? And some guys are like, hey, can we swap shirts? And have you got any pens? But everyone's like totally cool spirited. One of the things that really struck me, there was a guy coming the other way in a suit, proper suit, looked really good, and he had a straw hat on to the side, and I couldn't help but say to him, you look so cool. Well, he kind of stood out compared to everyone else yeah. that was around. He was quite sort of suited and booted with his little straw hat, bless him. So I said to him, um, I really like your hat, and I think you're one of the coolest guys I've seen. And he, with a massive smile, said, well, that's really kind of you. Do you want to keep it? And this is a man that, I mean, there was no, the best house in the village was owned by the chief and he had windows, right? He was the only one with windows. So here's a man that lives in a mud hut, definitely, okay? Lives on the occasional bit of chicken soup, bananas and loads of fruit and veg, and has nothing. And he's happy to give me his hat. And I think that really sums up Malawi. Some of the people have just been so unbelievably hospitable. It's, I think, very humbling. Yeah. I'd actually say out of all the countries we've been to so far, Malawi's been the most generous and friendly and ironically it's also the poorest and there's some pretty worrying stats about malawi here's a few of them for a start one in 12 of the one in 12 people have got hiv or aids it's uh, been an absolute epidemic over recent years and it's something that government's desperately trying to control and not doing a wonderfully good job in all honesty a lot of it thanks to the resources in the hospitals of which we spoke so there's a massive problem with hiv aids um, and as a result of HIV AIDS and just general not very good healthcare, the average life expectancy is the age of 46. And as a result of that, if you like, there's kids everywhere, right? 50% of the Malawi population is under 18. So you've got kids all over the show. But here they are, on the flip side, generous as you like and lovely, aren't they? Really warm to us. The other thing that was really weird was you just get kids all over the streets. And you wonder where their mums are yeah. or why their mums aren't wondering, you know, why aren't they home or where is my child? They're just literally just all across the road doing their own thing. It's like if you have a kid in Malawi, it's just someone that's going to help out in the fields and stuff. Primary school education is free, so they can hopefully go to school, although not all of them do. Um, but the concept of looking after it in a house just doesn't happen. Well, I don't think they've got doors anyway, a lot of those houses, have they? Not lockable ones. So even if you wanted to keep your kid in, it wouldn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) They just had to, like, they had drapes, didn't they? Instead of front doors, just drapes. And it makes you think about us in the West with our kids locking them up. Well, not locking them up, but encouraging them to stay in, giving them PlayStations. Yeah, well, you'd never get, back in England, you'd never get children just hanging around the sides of the road. And and these are like little children, like one, two years of age. They all seem to sort of look after each other. It's a sort of unwritten community. Like one kid falls down, the other one picks it up. And they, one of the other things I really like is they do not care how they look. It's just wearing like ramshackle clothes and they're all dirty and stuff. And again, it's really difficult to not sound sort of as if I'm elitist here. And I'm absolutely not because we look disgusting and smell quite a lot of the time. You particularly, Laura, you're honking. I actually smell very fresh at the moment. Showered this you, morning. You didn't shower this morning. <laughs> I've been monitoring your shower performance. Here I let go after like day three of trying to look good. I absolutely gave up. Now I wear some very questionable sandals. My only issue with Malawi so far is I've done really well with the bites. Come to Malawi, got 17 bites at one arm. <laughs> Can I just tell you, listener, I've heard that sentence 300 times today. I went over to her in the truck earlier. I was like, how are you? She goes, 17 bites, one arm. Just saying. Yeah, like you did five minutes ago. I've got a running tally of your bites, although it's quite impressive. Do you think yourself lucky you didn't go out on the boat the other day, like we all did, and burn to a crisp? So glad I wasn't on that boat trip. Seasick. I would have been just hanging over the back of it, constantly vomiting. <laughs> so that's news from Malawi, a, a place that's impoverished and difficult for a lot of people, but somehow retains this incredible, friendly, lovely atmosphere. We head now. We have a day in Mozambique Mm. and a night and then on to Zimbabwe and in Zimbabwe I believe we're going to Victoria Falls are you coming rafting sure am should be fun um how's this trip going in general 
really, really well. I'm absolutely loving it. Um, it's everything me and Jodie thought it would be. So, cool group as well, minus a few. <clears throat> Vinny. Good evening. <laughs> uh, we're really lucky with the group. I met an Australian the other day, and she said, how's your bus? Because she, she was on a bus, right? And she didn't get on very well with her group. And I said, yeah, I know our group's good. It's really good. I said, it's weird, actually, because before I left, I thought there'd be one absolutely massive penis on the bus. And she, quick as a flash, said, have you ever stopped to think it might be you? So, <laughs> right, I'm just going to go to the bar now. See you later. <laughs> Um, thank you, Laura. Do you want to say a quick hello to your family? I do want to say a quick hi to my mum and dad. Hello, Fitz. Good afternoon. You'll have to forgive the wind. Uh, we are currently on the truck and we have the roof open. It's a convertible truck and we're at the front and um, we're driving through Zimbabwe. We've been in Zimbabwe for some time. We wanted to talk about some of the things we've experienced and some of our thoughts about the place. Let's start at the beginning, I suppose. Zimbabwe. Um, it's a bit different, isn't it? We had to come through Mozambique. We're only in Mozambique for one day. Before that, you might know that we're in Malawi, and we've been in some very impoverished areas of Africa. Suddenly, you drive into Zimbabwe, big houses, swimming pools, wealth, Mercedes. What's going on? Yeah, um, plenty of big houses. First thing we got to, we got to Harare, and there were some spectacularly big houses, mansions with balconies, swimming pools, the whole nine yards. I suppose it's a throwback to the more affluent days before the ZANU PF took over and things went a bit hairy. Yeah, Harare is the capital, and uh, that's where ZANU PF headquarters are. ZANU PF is the political party behind the man, some would say the nutter, that is uh, Robert Mugabe. Um, yeah, interesting character, and he's created quite an interesting country. Let's have a quick if we can, between us. We, we've read up a bit since we've been here in Zimbabwe. Let's have a quick synopsis of, uh, of power here in this rather bizarre land. What, uh, where did it all start? I think it was Great Zimbabwe, the place we just came from, um, which was it's the oldest and largest settlement outside of the greater Egyptian area of the pyramids and the Sphinx and the, all that sort of stuff. So... It's not that old, though, by European standards. We went to Great Zimbabwe, the original settlement that gave its name to the original country, and um, it's only a 1,000 years old, isn't it? Yeah, big stone house, I think it translates roughly as... It's only about 1,000 years old. Um, when you think about Europe, you know, the church down the road from me in Brighton is a 1,000 years old, and it's quite epic in proportion. So in some ways, you could say that it's quite advanced for its age for Africa. But for the rest of the world, it really wasn't, was it? Yeah. No, no, not, not by any means. For sub-Saharan Africa, who were not as developed, it's quite a feat. But um, in terms of world history, it's not, that, it's not that old, no. So we used to have a country called Zimbabwe. It was full of some indigenous peoples that lived in stone houses, in a, mostly in a settlement called Great Zimbabwe. Then something happened when a bloke called Cecil Rhodes arrived, I believe. Yeah, our main man Cecil, multi-millionaire from Britain, uh, paid a, a lot of taxes to the Queen or King or I can't remember whoever was whoever was around then. So they were quite happy to turn the blind eye as he um, created some dubious treaties to uh, wrestle the lands from the uh, locals in exchange for small sums of money and quite a lot of guns. <laughs> yeah, if ever they said actually no thanks, we don't really want you to take over our land, he'd say well what about this hundred pounds and some guns? Sound alright? Give you some ammunition. It was always going to go wrong in the end. North Rhodesia, which is today Zambia and um, Southern Rhodesia, uh, were one country and the name Rhodesia comes from Cecil John Rose. That's quite an ego to have a, a country named after you. You must be quite pleased with that, or must have been quite pleased with that. So uh, development started, uh, Brits slowly started to have an impact on the place, and then uh, what happened next? I think it was the farming and diamond mines which really took off and uh, allowed for rapid expansion, and it was a lot, of, a lot of money. Black people couldn't own the best parts of land, and that was actually legislated as part of the government as well. That was actually written up law. Uh, also, they weren't offered the same education, and they were just generally repressed. Now, this was a time, of course, when there was a global repression uh, against uh, black people. 
and um, they were going pretty well as a British colony, or a, I don't even know if it was a colony of more of a protectorate, until the 60s when it was actually the white um, population themselves wanted independence, and which they achieved. I think Ian Smith was the name of the guy, the guy at the time, and then in 1980, our man Big Bob took over. Mugabe started fairly liberally, really, didn't he? In the 80s, he was not too crazy, didn't do anything too mad. Most of the governments around uh, here and, indeed, internationally were mostly on his side. And then his life started getting a little bit more gung-ho with some of his promises. To make sure that he would win elections, he'd start doing things like saying, if you vote for me, I'll make sure that you get lots of land. And this was to the black people. And the black people... Uh, who had been quite repressed, thought, well, this is a good deal. A lot of these war veterans were given vast tracts of land that were originally owned by the white people. And such began a mass exodus exodus of white people. Yeah, I think at one stage the population stood at about 350,000, and it's down, now down to about maybe 10,000, even less. Of white people in Zimbabwe, yeah. So that's a remarkable exodus of white people, and they were forced off the land. We've spoken to some people since we've been here, and most of which would like to remain anonymous for understandable reasons because tension is still quite rife here in Zimbabwe. And a lot of people have said that they've been treated incredibly brutally. They've uh, had their lands attempted to be taken over numerous times. Some gunshots have been fired by some uh, Zanu PF guys and indeed return fire by the landowners. Some things get very ugly. And when they do get their land taken over, if they're unfortunate enough to have this happen... Um, the farming that used to happen in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe used to be a breadbasket of the local area, shuts down. Uh, the new landowners don't really work the farms that well. Um, whether they're motivated to or not is another question, and, and the reasoning behind it is different. But, but the fact of the matter is, here was a country that was doing an incredible amount of exporting of foods and extremely rich, and now is actually importing foods, even though it's got an incredible climate for farming and great uh, fertile land. So something's gone very wrong with the government. Yeah, I mean, you just have some crackpot policies and ideas. It's remar remarkable the amount of people that we've met that have been violently angry with the way things are run. And I remember speaking to one taxi driver in particular just the other day who said, this political uprising, the Arab Spring that's gone on all across the Arab world over the last couple of years... He said, I have absolutely no doubt that the same thing would have happened in, here in Zimbabwe. There would have been an uprising if it wasn't for the simple fact that Mugabe's in his 80s, he's incredibly unhealthy. So therefore, you know, it, we're, we're in a situation where people are literally just waiting for him to die. A lot of people say he's got a double for when he does public speeches. Well, I think from talking to a couple of those younger Zimbabweans who have known nothing more than being a Zimbabwean, um, what he's done has actually further the divide between the white and black people rather than to uh, unite them because there's a bitterness there that these ZANU PF guys are showing up on their farms and, and causing havoc and um, rather than rather than making Zimbabwe a better place I think he's actually made it quite a difficult place to live. So we did the capital Harare, we've done Bulawayo, and we moved on uh, to Great Zimbabwe, the original settlement here in Zimbabwe. Hey, buddy, you know what's next, don't you? Uh, yeah, we'll what do we do? We'll probably go to Vic Falls and jump off a bridge. I'm planning on doing a gorge swing. Um, I'd quite like to go for a river cruise, which I believe has a free bar, um, and I'd quite like to um, I'd quite like to sit at the top of the falls if you're up for it. Yeah, that'd be good. I like the idea of a free bar. That could get a bit messy. An Irishman and an Englishman at a free bar. What could possibly go wrong? Hello, Fitz. How are you? I'm, I'm mildly drunk as well, Vinny. And uh, I believe that was because of my African accent. You remember that accent from Podcast 3. I'm Troy McClure. Right, we're going to try and pull this together. Where are we and what are we doing? Right now, we're on the Zambezi River, on, I think it's the Zambian site where we came from Zimbabwe, but we're actually nearer to the Zimba Zambian side, and we've just seen a hippo, uh, I suppose, chase us away. He kind of showed a display of strength because the boat had actually entered his territory. Worth mentioning that there is free alcohol on this, well, I say free, $35 was the price for the bar and boat, um, so it's not free, but it's... 
Well, it is free now. We've paid. And we're doing our very best to drink the amount of the cruise in alcohol. I saw the, the driver of this boat have a drink earlier, and I'm wondering if that's why he went towards a hippo and upset the hippo. Perhaps. TIA. I wonder if the hippo was just looking for a beer, and maybe that's why he was so irate. If we were to be as foolish as to follow this river for some time with the current, we would end up at Victoria Falls, the world's biggest waterfalls. More water passes over those falls than any other falls in the world. It is a stunning, a spectacular chasm. And yesterday, we did something that I genuinely think was utterly stupid. What did we do? Yesterday, we had the opportunity to swim on the edge of Victoria Falls, literally one metre away from the... I'm going to have to stop you and say it wasn't swimming. No, it was hanging onto a rock as hard as you could for fear of death. That's much more accurate. This is, could sound like hyperbole. No, we were one metre or less away from 107 metre drop to absolute definite death. Yeah, and we were in the first pool enjoying it. It was quite exhilarating. And Vinny asked the guide, could we go into the second pool? The guide said, I believe he said, uh, I don't know. I'll check it out. It is what he said. Also, you may remember him as a policeman with a speed camera from podcast. But yeah, he did go and check it out. He was only a wee fella and he definitely couldn't have saved us had we have gone with the current. But I guess just his knowledge and his, at least him being there made us feel better psychologically. He went to the other pool. And when I say the other pool, that's further away from the edge. So we're now further in the middle of the world's biggest waterfall with something, what is it, a million cubic metres per, per second? A million cubic metres per second. Think of it as a million baths a second. I suppose my confidence was really um, strengthened when the guy turned up and we were all standing, I suppose, maybe 10 metres away from the edge. We were holding hands. The guy turned up, stepped into the river and slipped. <laughs> yeah. He totally did. It was <laughs> I was going for a handshake. And I, I said, what's your name? And he goes, oh, Zambezi or something. Oh, no, that's the name of the river. Sorry, I'm slightly drunk. And he goes, his name was, um, what was his name? Oh, it was Orbit. I think his name was Orbit. And um, I went for a handshake and he fell over. Proper slammed. And I was like, right, so you're the bloke that's going to help us out, yeah? <laughs> yeah, and he was about four foot three and a half. <laughs> and there was more meat in him than a butcher's apron. <laughs> no, there was more meat on a butcher's apron. Sorry, I'm pretty pissed. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to um, sign off only for the fact that I know the bar's over there and there's no way I'm going to order a drink with this microphone. It's been a blast loving Zimbabwe. Don't like the ownership, any of the political system, nearly everything about the entire structure of the country, but it's uh, certainly full of some very fun people and fun times. Yeah, uh, what Vinny said, what Vinny said. <laughs> See you later. Bye. <laughs> Here we are, live in Botswana, in the middle of a national park called the Okavango Delta. How, how big is the park? 18,000 square kilometres. And today, we're somewhere in that 18,000 square kilometres. And the reason I'm being quiet is because in the distance we can see something. What, what's over there? What are we looking at? Zebras, butcher zebras. And how many zebras are there? Uh, I'm not sure, maybe 20. This is our guy, his name is Brave. And Brave, so far, has been explaining some of the bushland around us. And we have a little group from the bus, and here we are in the middle of... We really are in the middle of Africa. And um, it's very exciting. You've been teaching us lots of things. Can I try to tell you some of the things that you've taught me? You told us that there's poison apples around here. The snakes eat them to top up on their venom, and they used to be used for fishing. They used to throw them in the in the rivers, and all the fish would die. What else have we seen today here in the Okavango Delta? What else have you shown us? I've shown you a wild sedge, which is used as a mosquito repellent. Also, it can be used... Uh, the, the bushmen, when they go hunting, they can rub their leaves against their skins, and animals can't smell them, and they can go very close. 
and use their arrows to shoot them to death. What sort of animals live in the Okavango Delta? What, I mean, we're looking at some zebra over there. Presumably, they could be killed by a lion. Are there lions around here? Yeah, they are, except that they are mostly nocturnal. Okay, so they're probably sleeping now. What other animals are around? Uh, impala, warthogs, giraffes, many species of animals you can see here. And one of the good things about you being a guide is you keep showing us all the track markings. And also, you keep picking up pieces of poo and um, explaining which poo belongs to which animal. Also, you told us that if you burn elephant poo, what happens? It can be used as a repellent also, mosquito repellent. Fascinating stuff. What are we likely to see next? What, what do you want to show us? Trees. <laughs> Lots of trees. <laughs> OK, well, I will report later as we continue here live from the Okavango Delta. Can you explain where we are, please? Where are we? We are in the station called Garakao, and the island, I don't really know it. <laughs> and he's the guide, so what chance have we got? We're now um, about to push off with... A large stick. What's that stick called that you're holding? It's a pole. In Setswana, is Ngashi. So he's going to push off with a pole or a Ngashi, and we're going to go how far? About five kilometres or something? Yes, about five kilometres. How long have you been doing this polling? Uh, a year and a half. I think you're quite good at it, actually. Although you're not the fastest. Some, there's a man over there that says he's the fastest polar. No, he's not the fastest. I'm the fastest polar on earth. <laughs> well, let's see. You push off and I will describe the scenario. Thank you, Judge. Happy polling. Thanks a lot. And we're taking to the water now. It's probably a bit dangerous, this, in the sense that I've got quite a lot of it. Oh, there goes one of the girls, nearly fell in. Um, I've got quite a lot of expensive recording equipment. Oh, that wobbled. And um, it's on a very skinny boat. So just, just describe this boat. If, imagine two plastic chairs that would originally have legs on them. All right, now rip those legs off and put the plastic seats in the bottom of a carved-out canoe. And then get that carved-out canoe, which has got the width of not much more than a human body, um, to go through quite fast through some reeds. Here's some girls alongside. Hello. Hi. Are you enjoying your, your trip? Hell yeah. I see you're passing us. I'm not sure that we are the fastest polar on earth. Around us, we can see lots of lily pads and reeds and peppered in the distance, some large redwood trees. Oh, some of the flora and fauna we've been learning about over the last few days. And, uh, and it's full steam ahead now as he puts the pole into the water and we pole down the Okavango Delta here. It's a beautiful day. It's early morning. Uh, Pete, the driver of the big yellow fun bus, is sitting behind me. I'm going to pass the microphone back to Pete. Pete, are you there? I can't look round because if I do, I'll fall in. So, um, are you there, Pete? Yes, I am. I don't know, I'm feeling um, like it's been a very good couple of days in the Delta. Um, we travelled for perhaps two hours to get to our island, uh, where we've been camped for the past two days. Uh, we've had a few walks to go and see some animals. Uh, unfortunately, we've only really seen some zebra because um, it's out of season. But the relaxing sort of environment has been nonetheless fantastic. And... Um, the guides all did a little show for us last night, like a traditional dancing show, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. What did you think of it, Vinny? I thought it was amazing because you, a lot of the times you go to hotels here and there's a, a dressed up, um, very organised dance. Last night it was much more fluid. They weren't wearing official clothes. And these guys have been our guides for the last few days. We've really got to know them and they've helped us with cooking and setting up tents and all that stuff. So we never really saw them as dancers and performers, did we? It was just a load of nice people having fun. And then last night, sort of impromptu, they just started around the fire singing and dancing, and they got a choir going, and it was amazing. We actually recorded a little bit, and you can hear a bit due to the wonder of technology right now. <laughs> I 
Something I'd like to just add about the uh, dancing was that um, it was done without the aid of any drums or anything like that. It was just people stomping on the ground for a beat or clapping. Uh, and then one of them would lead with some singing and the others would chant after them. And eventually we ended up dancing around the fire as well. It's thoroughly good. Uh, now we're going back to our, going back to the station which we started at. Um, before we go back to the yellow truck. Um, for me, well, it's back to the road. Um, Botswana is a nice country to drive through actually. There's no roadblocks or any such like that and unnecessary bureaucracy so far. Um, and we're heading towards Namibia. Um, via a couple of bush camps, which means we can make our own, some of our own fires and we're going to try and make a fire using nothing but the environment around us next time we stop. Um, I'm sure Vinny will let you know how that goes. If there's a massive bush fire in Botswana, it went a bit too well. <laughs> Cruising through some reeds on a small dugout wooden boat with Pete, the driver of the fun bus. And um, obviously he's not driving at the moment because he's a passenger on a canoe. Slightly different to your daily day. Pete, tell us, what's a good day and what's a bad day when you're driving through many different African countries as you do for a living? Uh, that's an interesting question, Vinny. Um, it's a lot easier to define a bad day than a good day because something happens to make the day bad. Um, good days, I like a challenge on the road. Okay, I don't like uh, some of the roads are very empty, the surface is good, and it's just a bit like motorway driving. A, a good drive challenge, whether that be lots of vehicles or um, potholes and things, um, it makes it more challenging. It's just more fun. Um, also, if we get somewhere on time and we don't have that many hold-ups, that's also good. And if everybody's... If all the passengers are happy and get off happy, that's that's also good. Um, bad days, uh, I suppose the biggest contributor to a bad day are either breakdowns or um, police. Police being the much more common, um, they can hold you up for no apparent reason, really. What about other African drivers? I mean, just as a passenger, I've witnessed some fairly outlandish manoeuvres from other vehicles. You must get frustrated with the occasional insanity. Um, they drive very naturally. Imagine you're walking through a uh, very crowded shopping centre, um, but everybody's in cars. But that does mean that if you get into their mode of thinking, you don't have to drive like them, but um, if you get into their mode of thinking and you just expect the unexpected, then it's fine. I, I don't find it that, that difficult to adjust to this way of driving. And it's also, it's all done very friendly. So what's next? Are you going to be, after this trip, I mean, we all get on with our lives, whatever they are. I'm not sure about that, but we'll get to that another time. Uh, and you get straight back in the truck, drive it back up to Nairobi, I think, isn't it, in Kenya, and then pick up a load more passengers. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, we've got a short turnaround this time. Um, so we're driving, I'm leaving you guys at the Namibian border with South Africa, uh, and I'm driving back up to Harare to do some work on the truck and then we have a workshop there and then up to Nairobi and the next trip starts uh, mid-March. Does it ever get a bit March? I mean, I know you get the odd day off, like, for example, last night, sitting around the fire with me, drinking some wine, relaxing, but you do, uh, you spend a lot of hours in, in that vehicle. How does that feel? Well, I enjoy driving. Uh, that's not to say that I don't have days where I would prefer to be somewhere else or not driving. Um, but it's the job. Ladies and gentlemen, Pete, the driver, the legend, the hero, the man at the helm of the ship. The good ship fun. The big yellow fun bus. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Vinny. We are on the other side of Africa. We are on the West Coast. Yeah. West Coast, looking out over the Atlantic. Here I am in Namibia. Namibia, a place called Cape Cross. And you may, in a moment, hear some rather peculiar noises. Because Cape Cross 
is home to a lot of seals. Yeah, an awful lot of seals. Cape fur seals. They don't migrate, they just hang out here in Cape Cross by the thousands. And as I'm, as I'm heading towards the sea now, I can see thousands, thousands and thousands of seals draped over rocks, feet in the air. Some of the young pups that were born in November are now uh, suckling away on their mum's nipples. Sounds wrong when I say that. Take your mind out of the gutter. It's life. And here they are in their majesty and glory. They look fantastic. There's a walkway that's built across um, the seafront so people don't get to disturb them, but they do get to witness them. Sometimes a seal comes wandering up the walkway. They're very friendly. There's a few dead ones knocking about because mortality for the young is always a bit tricky. Something like uh, 25% of the uh, seals don't make it past uh, being a being a young pup because it's a tough life in the seal world. If you go out to go fishing, you might lose your mum, you might get battered against some rocks, you might make it home and get involved in a stampede, or you might be eaten by a hyena. If you're thinking about coming back as a seal, I'd say think again. One of the other things that you might want to consider if you want to come back as a seal is the smell. Um, I cannot describe to you quite how disgustingly pungent and overpowering the smell of seal poo is mixed with raw fish. I'm actually gagging. Oh, God, I'm not even making that up. Hang on. It's like walking into a fish shop times 30. Uh, maybe some raw sewage smeared across the walls. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it. A fish shop with 30 times the normal amount of fish, most of it gone off, and someone smeared poo over the walls. So that's nice. However, that said, it is actually beautiful, and uh, the white waves of the Atlantic Ocean are crashing, and the seals are knocking around having a bit of fun in the sun. And uh, here we are in Namibia, in the desert, actually. The desert just meets up with the sea. There's really nothing around us apart from seals and rocks. They have a pretty much 100% fish diet, so... They don't need any greenery, and it's just as well, because there isn't any around here. Very much a sparse wasteland. <coughs> Good interview one, but I'm not sure it's going to be great. There's one just around here. I'll, I'll pass him the microphone. You never know what he might have to say. You know, this could, could be his big shot. This could be the life-changing moment that he's been looking for to get out of Cape Cross and the seal population. He could be signed up by a LA producer, maybe for a seal film. I don't know, just the working title could be Seal the Deal. Just thinking about that. Let's uh, pass the mic down to him, see what he says. Hello. So, what do you, what do you think about the uh, local environment here, and uh, just how much fish do you eat a day? Well, luckily, thanks to this pamphlet that I've been given, I can tell you the actual answer is 8% of their body mass per day. That's an enormous amount of fish. When you look at the hundreds of thousands of seals that are around me and then think about the fact that each of them are eating 8% of their body weight in fish, there must be a lot of fish out there, an awful lot of fish, which will explain why uh, there's some quite keen anglers uh, driving up and down this desert road here in Namibia uh, with all their fishing rods on the front of their trucks. I wouldn't imagine they fish around here because you're going to compete with some serious seals, but up and down the coast there are some great fishing spots. It's a really amazing part of the world, actually. It's uh, desert meets ocean, and uh, apparently the seals love it. <coughs> One minute you're in a truck, having a chat, playing cards, drinking a beer. Next thing, you know, you're at a seal sanctuary uh, on the Atlantic Ocean. God, I love Africa.
Wakamund in Namibia is one of the oddest places I've ever been in the world, actually. It's very rich and has these very large streets, huge grid system. It's very much a new city. It feels like either Australia or somewhere in North America. Very new, very shiny, very clean KFCs and lots of chain restaurants everywhere. And then, of course, adrenaline sports, loads of them. Is that how the city makes its money? Yeah, I think definitely that's the way it makes its money. That's the whole market pushes for it, all the different uh, activities out in the dunes and whether you're jumping out of a plane, looking down on the dunes or on motorised transport, going across the dunes or standing on boards going down the dunes. Yeah. It's where the, where the sand dunes meets the sea and provides for quite a lot of sporting activities. We went sandboarding, didn't we, Fitz? We did go sandboarding. How do you think it went? Well, I suppose it went pretty well. I mean, you lost half your shorts, so I mean, that. I don't know how it went for you, but I mean, I'd never snowboarded before, and on uh, my third run, I actually tried hitting that jump. It, Success-wise, I suppose you, you'd probably give me a 2 out of 10, because rather than the board hitting the sand, it was my face. But uh, aside from that, I thought it, was, it went pretty well. Yeah, success-wise, I suppose it was a two. But effort-wise, I think it'd have to be a 9.5. You're in for it from the beginning. And for someone that's never boarded, you had some confidence. It's not really like snowboarding, if you ask me. I mean, you are wearing a snowboard and snowboard boots. But there's some fundamental difference. First of all, you have to climb up a hill, which is a killer when it's 35 degrees. Let me tell you that. When you get to the top of the hill, you have to wax your board, because if you don't, you're not really going anywhere on the sand. Once you've waxed your board, had a swig of water, got yourself together, put your helmet on, you then strap yourself in and sandboard down the sand dune. Indeed, there is a jump halfway down, which I tried to use to jump and accidentally landed on. I think the best way to put it in a polite context would be that I landed on the ramp and used my genitalia as brakes, thereby not only hurting myself in my private parts, but also ripping my new shorts right down the back. Oh, I tried to do the jump just before you. Uh, they were getting me all lined up to go straight down and I started off and I couldn't really control the board and it started veering off right so I had to scrap the jump and by the time I got to the bottom and uh, looked back up Vinny was, you know, making his way towards the edge and he went for it. And you know, I, he's done a bit of snowboard and I was reasonably confident that he was going to nail this and uh, he, he kind of took a little bit of a tumble to the left. Slight speed wobble, I thought. You know, he was going to correct himself. And, um, yeah, he basically cut his balls in half on the edge of the ramp. One of the Germans on the bus saw the horrific job that I did of stitching my pants up, felt sorry for me, undid the stitching and redid it in a, in a way that can only be described as professional, not the shoddy attempt at stitching that I'd done beforehand. So I think they're as good as new now, eh? Yeah, definitely better than the way you did them. It looked like some blind child with no fingers did it with a steak knife. <laughs> and that's being complimentary. Hello, Australian. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Grand. What's your name and where do you come from? I'm Lisa and I'm from Adelaide. Are you a real-life Australian? Yes, I'm a real-life, living, breathing Australian. And who's the sexy, young, bearded man next to you? This is Rhys, my husband. Hi! <laughs> what do you think of Swakamund? Can you describe it? Very westernised, wasn't it? Definitely very westernised. Love the activities that were there, all the sandboarding, skydiving, quad biking, things like that. We had a ball there. It's known as the adrenaline capital of Namibia for obvious reasons. It's got all of those sports and a lot more as well. Did you jump out of a plane or is this a sore point? No, I did jump out of a plane. It took me uh, a day or so to build up the courage. I, I actually didn't know that. So you did do it the second day because you were supposed to do it on day one. You came back with a slightly sad face. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I cancelled it before we even went on the first day, but then woke up the second day and thought, no, I'm going to do it, so went in and booked it. 
and then jumped out of a plane. It's kind of a bit like sort of an African Las Vegas. <laughs> it shouldn't really be a city, but it just seems to be there anyway. What's it like jumping over that amazing and bizarre city? Um, well, to be honest, didn't really notice too much of the view. <laughs> it was the first time I've jumped, so... Um, no, no, it's definitely different seeing the sea, like you say, with the desert. A bit bizarre. Is there anything else we missed? What else did we do in Swakaman? Go-karting. Oh, yeah. Went go-karting. Yeah, don't bring it up. No, we went go-karting, and I, I might have beaten Vinny. Might have done, but you'll never know, because... Um, Oh, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. <laughs> thanks a lot, Lisa and Reese, the Australians. Enjoy. No worries. Thanks a lot. So we left Swakamund and headed south across the desert in Namibia and down to our final destination, the last land of the eight countries we've been through. Seven countries. The last place on our agenda. And it's here, South Africa. The sun's shining, it's 30 degrees. And we've been in South Africa for a few days. We went to a place called Stellenbosch after we made our way through the unforgiving deserts of southern Namibia and northern South Africa. And Stellenbosch was a very welcome surprise. I'm joined by a German, Regina. Hello, Regina. Hello, Vinny. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's been a pleasure and a delight being on a bus with you throughout this. Um, here we are in South Africa. We went to Stellenbosch. Thoughts on Stellenbosch? Well, Stellenbosch was a very westernised university city with a lot of young students. It didn't feel very African to me, I must say. So to begin with, I didn't quite know what to make of it. But after two days, I quite liked it. It's very affluent. Last night, to try and submerge ourselves in the culture and understand the place, we went to a rugby game. I don't... I personally, I didn't look at the pitch much. I was looking more at the atmosphere and the madness around us. And good-looking people. <laughs> it's a very good-looking city, isn't it? It certainly is, and uh, I'm a bit like yourself because we don't have rugby in Germany, so uh, it was my second rugby game ever, and I didn't know anything about it, but luckily we had a Tiff um, sitting next to me, so she tried to explain the game to me. But as I said, I was a bit like yourself. I was uh, looking around, uh, watching uh, the cheerleaders. Uh, we don't have cheerleaders in Germany either, I must say call that a civilization, Germany. If you haven't got cheerleaders, how, how do you exist? I don't know. You might not call it an existence then. <laughs> Looking from a journalistic point of view, I couldn't help but notice, journalistic point of view, that they were, they were very attractive. Yeah. Looking from a female point of view, they might have been attractive, but they were out of sync. Oh, they were terrible dancers. Stellenbosch. A very peculiar town in the fact that everyone was young. Now, you and I... Oh, I wouldn't say we're old, but we're older. Did you feel old there? Very old, but to tell you the truth, I've been feeling very old ever since I joined this group. <laughs> <laughs> There's an annoying amount of young people on the bus. Coming home at nine in the morning the other day. They came home at nine, and there's us. Right, yeah, out for breakfast, looking at them going, look at those hoodlums. <laughs> Stellenbosch, I think there's two universities there. Many hundred years ago, when these lands were settled or, should we say, taken over from the indigenous population, the Dutch came in, and Afrikaans is very much like the Dutch language, almost interchangeable. So what we've got here is a lot of Dutch people. Now, Holland is the tallest country in the world, which means that everyone here is very tall, very blonde, and very beautiful. And I, I must admit, I did feel a bit inadequate. Now, you're gorgeous, so you probably didn't have that problem. <laughs> Got out of that one. But uh, what were your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> such a, uh, such a shit long loaded question. I've got to edit it now. Actually, the guys playing rugby, they weren't all that beautiful. I was surprised. Some of them were really fat, I would say. So some of them didn't look very sporty to me. I mean, I'm not an expert by no means, but <laughs> I was surprised. I, I, I thought the people watching 
look much sportier than some of the guys actually on the field there. Do you know what struck me yesterday? There were hardly any black people around, neither in the teams nor in the audience. Yes, since the fall of apartheid in South Africa in the 90s, South Africa has changed. But judging solely on the ratio of blacks and whites in Stellenbosch, it's got a long way to go. After all, only 10% of the population of South Africa, slightly less than 10% of the population, is white. Whereas in the university, it must have been at least 90% of the students were white. So this black touch was missing at the rugby game yesterday, but it was also missing in Stellenbosch in general. And now we're on a bus again, and we're heading into Cape Town. Um, and I've got the, a view of Table Mountain in the background, uh, which is covered in cloud, which I believe they call the tablecloth. And uh, we're going to be here for a few days. Well, you, you and the rest of the trip are all dividing. Is it our last night tonight? Yes, Vinny, I hate to say this might be our last night sharing the same dorm together. And um, it has been a great pleasure for me. As I said to the girls last night, this might be our last chance to share a room with um, three boys, let's say. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> boys mentally, certainly. So I said it's now or never, but apparently it's going to be never. <laughs> well, um, have we been perfect gentlemen throughout? Yes, you have. You've been perfect in every way. And... Sharing a room with you has been the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> well, you've been uh, wonderful to share a dorm with as well, ladies. Thank you, Regina. Thanks, nice talking to you, Vinny. Well, I've left the bus behind. The bus, indeed, has gone back up now to reload full of passengers and do another run, but without me. Yes, indeed, I'm on my own. Some of the people that are on the bus are still here in Cape Town, but a lot of them have gone, and uh, I continue on through South Africa on my own. Since I haven't got a bus, I had to have some transport. My wheels are a scooter. Oh, yeah, I rock. And I'm here on the beach at the southernmost point of South Africa, which is the southernmost point of Africa. Here I am looking at two oceans merge, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And it's extraordinarily beautiful. 26 degrees, ice cream in one hand, microphone in the other. Can get a bit confusing. I just licked the microphone. And things are going well. Cape Town has been beautiful so far. Very impressed with the place. It's got quite a good vibe downtown on Long Street where I'm staying. It's not the cleanest of cities, I don't think, but it's uh, certainly a vibrant one with loads of nightlife and music all over the show. And I went up the other day to Table Mountain, the iconic Table Mountain that looks down on this vast bay of a city. And it was uh, pretty good, actually. It took three hours to get up there and uh, about five minutes to get down on a Swiss cable car. Uh, because, frankly, I couldn't be bothered to walk down again. But yeah, after a three-hour hike, looking at the sunset over this amazing place felt pretty good indeed. Is that an ostrich? Oh, I'm just looking at an ostrich as well. It's nothing like an ostrich to put you off your point. What was I going to say? Um, <laughs> it's just looking over a tree at me. I am trying to do a podcast, trying to be professional. Can you take your little head and your big body away, please? <laughs> right, where was I? Yeah, there's so many weird animals. That's what I was going to say. There's some really weird animals that you don't expect. On the drive down here, big warning sign, warning, baboons. That was weird. And then I was knocking about in a little place called Simon's Town, a small seaside dwelling. I saw a penguin in a, in a drainage tunnel. Just by the side of the road, there was just a small penguin hanging out in a drainage tunnel. It was like Gaddafi's last moments, only it wasn't very sad and didn't involve Gaddafi. Really weird to see penguins here. I didn't actually know there were penguins 
in Africa. Apparently, there's loads. There's uh, plenty up the west coast as well. Obviously, not quite the emperor penguins that you'd expect uh, from the icy wastelands of the Antarctic, but there are penguins nonetheless. Very cute little things they were too. And uh, so there's always surprises here in Africa. So you join me from Soweto, Johannesburg. Soweto used to be outside Johannesburg and it was a township built for black people, by the white people. Essentially to get them out of the centre of the town and give them their own dwellings. Forced against their will, even though they were probably about 85-90% of the population, they cooperated and Soweto was born. Today is actually quite a middle class neighbourhood. There's some very run down parts of it as it's still growing on a daily basis. But in central Soweto, it's not too bad. We have just went to the Hector Pearson Museum. Hector Pearson was someone uh, that was at school here during 1976. In those days, it was pre-apartheid, but there was a lot of tension building. And when the white government enforced Afrikaans, the Dutch language, to be spoken by the Bantu peoples, there was an uprising. And Hector Pearson was one of those involved in the conflict. And Hector Pearson was shot. One of many that was shot that day, open fired on by the government forces, the police and the government forces. Now, usually an uprising, although it's always a very bitter thing, promotes change and usually it promotes positive change but in this case it absolutely didn't that was the beginning of apartheid apartheid is an Afrikaans word for being apart and the solution well what they thought was the solution at the time was to make sure that black people and white people were segregated so in the mid 70s that's what happened segregation began white people sat on white benches used white toilets went to white schools black people lived in these townships the ANC, fronted by Nelson Mandela, the Black People's Party, one of the Black People's Parties, was uh, declared as a uh, terrorist organisation. And uh, Nelson Mandela, as we all know, was locked up. And such began a very difficult time here in South Africa. And I'm on my way to Nelson Mandela's house now. Nelson Mandela used to live here before he was put into prison on uh, an island near Cape Town. And he's very much been hailed a hero ever since his release. A lot's changed since his release. Of course, in 1994, apartheid had been abolished and a black government came into existence. It would be great to say to you that since then, everything in South Africa has got better. Since 1994, the black government has changed hands a number of times. M Mandela himself fronted it when he was released, and things were looking very positive for South Africa. But in recent years, Jacob Zuma, who's still in power for the next couple of years, has been doing some rather questionable things with large amounts of money. Yes, Jacob Zuma, who went on trial for rape in 2005, he stated in, in court that he took a shower afterwards to cut the risk of contracting HIV. This statement, of course, was condemned highly by the judge and health experts. Uh, he has several wives, one of which he paid 10 cows for, and he has about 20 children, including one love child. And this is the president of South Africa. So you wonder why sometimes people are disillusioned. The nine-foot-high electric fence around this house next to me tells me that crime happens here quite a lot. And the house I'm uh, staying at in the suburbs, so it has so much security, it actually has guard dog ostriches so I guess you'd call them guard ostriches it's a funny old country what's your name? my name is Nebu and here we are outside Nelson Mandela's house and you've just done some very funky dancing where did you learn your dance moves? Uh, Planet at uh, Soweto White City Java. do you live here in Soweto? yes I live at Soweto can you tell me about what it's like to live here? Because Soweto's changed a lot since it was first developed. It looks quite rich in some areas now. What's it like living in Soweto? Ah, it's fun living in Soweto because it's a free, free country and uh, you can do whatever you want to do at any time you want to do it. Yeah, I, I was, they used to be at the early 80s. There was apartheid all over this place. You couldn't do something to, to satisfy your needs because of someone. Now you can do everything. You're quite a young man. You must have been quite young. Do you remember apartheid? 
Yes, I remember a little bit because at early 94, it's a apartheid, you see. Yeah, it's finished on 1994. Yes. Well, I'm glad that you live in a world where you can do what you want to do and you do it very well. You're one of the funkiest dancers I've ever seen. You're better than those idiots on American Idol. <laughs> So it was the Africa podcasts and the Africa trip comes to an end. It's been really quite something quite special, a trip of the lifetime really. The odd situation of being stuck with a group of people on a truck for days and days and months and months on end is uh, it could have been unbearable if the people were unbearable, but most of them were really great actually. And if you're thinking about doing a similar trip, remember there's no way of knowing that your group will be a good bunch or a bad bunch, but it's well worth taking the gamble. There's lots that happened that I didn't report in these podcasts, mostly involving toilets. But as you can see, Africa is a great place. We had no thefts, we had no security problems and no trouble. People were so hospitable beyond belief. Far more hospitable, in fact, than much of the first world. Thank you for listening to these special African podcasts. The music has been brought to you by Oliver Muskutsi, Mr. Kanda Bongo Man, Afro Celt Sound System and Left Field. All recording, mixing and messing about was done by me, Vinnie White, often on a moving truck on a dirt track. So it hasn't been award winning, but it's been great fun to put together. The podcasts have been made for me and anyone that's bored enough to listen to them and will be available at vinniewhite.co.uk until further notice. They've been dedicated to my friend Greg Hubert. Greg would be doing a trip uh, similar to this if it wasn't for the fact that illness has got in his way. I've been speaking to him throughout this trip and one of the things that I've learned from the things that I've seen and the things that he said is that if you're thinking about going to Africa or anywhere else in this amazing world, do it. Just book it and don't worry about all the other stuff because you only regret the things in life you don't do. So do it because life is fragile and you never know what's going to happen. And with that in mind, I dedicate these podcasts to Greg Hibbert. Bye bye, Africa. You were spectacular. Well done if you're still listening. Pat on the back. That was 2012. That was a flashback to travelling Africa. Now it's 2024 and it's been great listening to these again. Thanks for joining me on this flashback. You might have noticed just there that I finished the podcast by dedicating it to one of my friends, Greg Hebert. He was really ill at the time I took that trip and I thought about him a lot. He was a fellow radio announcer in Canada, where I lived at the time. Later in 2012, Greg died, and I still miss him, and I probably... And I probably always will. Greg's son, Grady, was born months after Greg died, and now... His son is old enough to listen to these podcasts. So, hello, Grady. I was a good friend of your dad's. I hope these Africa podcasts motivate you to travel a bit later in your life. Hey, guess where I'm going tomorrow? the fucking philippines no need to swear there just got a bit excited keep your eye out on this feed the next stop will be a new country i'm off to 
the Philippines. So I will report in soon. Big love. Yeah, for the good day, for the good day, for the